Uh, well, Happy New Year, everyone. If, if I haven't said to you yet, Happy New Year. Uh, welcome to 2017. Feels a lot like 2016 so far, but that's just the way it goes. Curious, how many of you have already, how many of you made a New Year's resolution? Anyone? Have you made a res- New Year's resolution? Yeah, there's like, same like last service, there's like three hands that went up. We don't do this anymore. Have you noticed? Isn't it kind of just like a joke? anymore like about the new year's resolution things because you know because my next question was going to be how many have already broken your new year's resolution because that's you know that's where we're at so i thought man you know maybe we just get a little bit of help on this um if you're looking for a good new year's resolution twitter's always really helpful with that kind of a thing right so i got some here that if you're not sure what to do this is a place to start um to read articles completely in closed tabs and not let them linger throughout the day does that make sense? Anyone do that? Am I the only, maybe I'm, again, maybe the only one in here does this. Like, you, you have an article or something you want to read, so you leave the tab open, and you open up another link. Oh, I wanna, I'll go do that later. You leave no one. And, okay, maybe some of you, like, is my wife in here? Okay, I love you, dear. But that girl will have, like, 30 tabs open, and she wonders, she asked me, why is the computer running slow? And I'm like, come on, hon. Like, this is, this is, this is and, and my daughter's already doing that, too. So that's a simple one, right? You could do that. Uh, learn the difference between effect and effect. Any grammar Nazis in this room that just drive anyone crazy? How about learn the difference between your and your? Your and you are, right? Can we please learn the difference between that? Okay. Uh, this one I really thought was very practical. Make an actual resolution sometime before next September. I like that. It's, it's, I mean, isn't that practical? Like, like I'm going to actually make a decision by next September because we all know that it doesn't really happen. And he said, I'm going to have to set a reminder on my calendar. I think that's great. That's why New Year's resolutions don't really last, because, you know, you kind of do it last minute, spur of the minute, and that's why it doesn't really last. This guy's saying, well, if I'm going to do something, I should really think about it. And so my resolution is to figure something out by September. That's great. That's really smart. Uh, This one, last year's resolution was 180. This year, I'm bumping it up to 4K. Right? That's, anyone else looking for a nicer new TV? See, I said that one last, anyone get that joke? 1080. 1080p versus 40K? Come on. Okay. No. Okay. We're just going to keep moving on. For those of you techie people, you got it. You laughed with me. We're done. Okay. This one, finish a chapstick. This is setting the bar really low. <laughs> finish a chapstick. Guys, I mean, if, if, if you do that, kind of, you should just drink more water. I mean, that's, that's what you need to do. Then your lips will stay. But yeah, finish a chapstick. The last one I just had to put out because it made me laugh. Get rich or cry trying. So, <laughs> guys, we, uh, those are so cheesy. I, I, I was literally last night, I was kind of practicing, like, I don't want to do this. This is cheesy. But I'm thankfully, some of y'all love some cheese. I love it. Thank you for laughing alongside of me. Thank you. All right. You know, obviously, uh, the New Year's resolution thing, it doesn't last. And you, you know what the most, the number one thing that people resolve is to get healthy, right, and to lose weight. Now, I know I, know I might not look like it, but many times in my past, I've actually done this. I've actually pursued this. I actually made that resolution that this year is going to be the year of health. And at one point, I went six months, guys, six months into this thing. And I kind of mentioned this last week, but, you know, you go to the gym, and you meet these people, and they're like, this is the best part of my day. My day would be ruined if I didn't make it to the gym, okay? I'm on medication for my ADD because I got, like, this imbalance up here that, that needs help with, right? I want that imbalance, okay? What I'll trade what I have so that I can get that imbalance, because I just don't get it, guys. I, I'm telling you, six months into this, I was, I'd lost 60 pounds, okay? And, 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 I've been, and I was waiting for that moment that these really healthy, weird people were telling me, it'll kick in, you'll start to love it. It'll be like your favorite thing. Guys, six months into this thing, it was still the worst thing to get on that bicycle. I'm not, I'm like, I'm not exaggerating. That into those months, I had to force myself on it. It was agonizingly difficult to get on that thing. And when I sat down and with that pathetic plate in front of me, right? I mean, it was awful. It was awful. And, and this is why, guys, this is why New Year's resolutions just don't work. Because we always choose these things that are just agonizingly difficult, right? Getting on the bike, getting in the gym, jumping in the water and doing some swimming or, or saying no to my wife's homemade puppy chow. Like, these things are... So can they can be agonizingly difficult, right? Today we're going to talk about how, guys, if, if we are, if we're pursuing something agonizingly difficult for God in our relationship with God, that probably means that we're actually living by faith. I know that might sound extreme, right? To do something agonizingly difficult for God 
means that we're probably on the right path, taking the right steps. But as we look into God's word, we're going to see, like, it's about as clear as day. But so before we jump into that, though, let's pray. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for this day. And God, you know that my words are just not going to be enough, especially for this topic. And so, Jesus, my, my simple request is that you'd be glorified in this room in such a way that people would know how important this is. And that people would take the, the seed of your word and that would go deep down into their hearts today. I pray that your spirit would be with us in this place today, preparing our hearts to hear what your word says so clearly. I pray that we would make peace with the truth that we're about to, 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 to look at here today. And that you would go with us from this place. Again, because I know that my words are just, they're temporary, they're going to get lost, they're going to get lost in the busyness of today and tomorrow and the holidays, God. And Simply I just ask that you'd be glorified in such a way that this word would go with us. Because we need this, God. The world needs this so bad. So please do it, Father, in this place, in your name, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for the cross. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Luke 13, verse 22. But before we actually dig into that, um, at the, as we look at this idea that if we're doing something agonizingly difficult and how that kind of gives us an indication that we're probably on the right step of faith, you know, taking the right steps of faith, we're also going to be looking at a question um, that is, that's a really, it's a really tough question that kind of, it might not seem like it goes hand in hand, but again, by the end, we'll kind of see how these two things fit together. And the question is this, okay? If Jesus is the only way, if Jesus is the only way to God, doesn't that mean that a vast majority of people living now and those who have lived and those who are going to come will not find the way to God? Okay? I'm going to ask that question again. we got to let this one sink in. If Jesus is the only way, doesn't that mean that a vast majority of people are not going to find the way to God? Now, I know that some of you I've thought about this question. You've made peace with this question in your own heart, in your own faith. But guys, this question should matter to us. Because I've met many, many people that this is a stumbling block to them coming to Jesus. Okay? And especially in, in our culture today, where there's a thing, well, Jesus is just one of the ways to God. There's lots of ways to God, you know, that, that's very much prevalent in our society today, guys, that this is a stumbling block to people wanting to follow Jesus. And so even if, even if you have made peace with this in your heart, you should care about this question. You should care about it in such a way that you can speak intelligently to answer this question because, again, you are going to run into people who have a problem with God because of this. So you should care about it. You should study it. You should know how to answer this and talk about it intelligently. So as, as we, with that challenge, Jesus was asked this question, so we should probably know what he said in return, right? So Jesus was asked this question. It's found in Luke 13, 22. Through 30. It says, Then Jesus went through the towns and the villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Now, right now, Jesus is in Perea. Perea is on the eastern side of the, of the, of the Jordan River. Okay, Judea is on the western side. The Jews, okay, the Jews don't have as much of a hold and don't have as much power in Perea. That doesn't mean, that doesn't necessarily make, uh, doesn't, it's not very important to our story today. It will next week when you come back. Notice how I said when you come back, right? Next week, that'll be more important. But the reason why I bring that up is because, so Jesus is in a place now where people are really loving him. They're very much seeking for God. They're very curious about who this Jesus is. And when you're on the east side of the Jordan in Perea, you notice the questions very much seem to be a lot more about actually seeking God versus when Jesus is in Jerusalem, there's a lot of questions where Jesus is trying to be trapped, Okay, where people are trying to trap Jesus with the question. So it's kind of a relief to be in Perea right now with a real genuine question about God versus something where someone has already made up their mind about God and they're just trying to trap Jesus. Okay? So this is obviously coming from someone who's actually genuinely seeking. Listen to this. Someone asked him, verse 23, someone asked him, Lord, are there only a few people that are going to be saved? That's a pretty clear, right? Pretty clear, direct question. He said to them, verse 24, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter, but will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I did not know you or where you come from. And then you will say, We ate and drank with you, and you taught us on the streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, you evildoers. There will be weeping there will be weeping there, a gnashing of teeth, when you see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves have been thrown out. 
People will come from the east, the west, the north, and the south, and they will take their place at the feast of the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who, will be, who are last who will be first, and the first who will be last. Now, as you read this, this sounds like a pretty cold and harsh to Jesus. Now, you've got to understand, when we are reading the Bible, you always got to keep in mind, this was something that was written in Greek that we are translating into English. And if you've ever studied a second language, you know how many things can get lost in the translation, especially when you're just going straight from text, okay? If you don't have someone who is a part of the culture, who is a part of, you know, they, the way they phrase things and what they mean behind the phrasing, I mean, we all have that in our languages, and that can be even specific to different areas. The same phrase can carry almost a different meaning, right? I mean, we see that in our language as well, okay? So we've got to recognize there's a big difference between Greek and English, and there's a big difference between a first century Jew, the way that their, the way that their culture was, their worldview view, okay, the way that they looked at God, very different from the way that a 21st century American looks at God, okay, very, very different. So when we talk about things being lost in translation, that's, that's why, guys, I find people who are much smarter than me, and I read what they say about history and all this stuff in the Bible, that's why commentaries and Bible dictionaries are not just necessarily for people who went to Bible college. You have access to those resources, you can use them. Because they can help you in your study of God. Because they can help you kind of flesh out what Jesus is saying here. Like, for example, when Jesus is talking here, you can tell that he's actually aiming his answer at the Jews in the area. Okay? The Jews that are in, because of what he says here in uh, verse 25. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand on the side knocking and pleading. Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer. Listen to his answer. It says, I don't know you or where you come from. I don't know you or where you come from. To the first century Jew... That would have been a very difficult pill to swallow. Because where you come from is everything to a Jew. Okay, The owner of the house, obviously being God, rejecting them and saying, I don't know where you come from, would have been, what are you talking about, Jesus? I'm a Jew. I'm a son of 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 a son and so on, of Abraham. And Abraham set our family apart. Our Abraham, God, because of Abraham, God set our nation apart to be holy to be a nation of priests, to be the first, and then everyone else comes next, okay? That, that God set us apart, and that is a very important part of their faith. That because I can say my dad was, uh, came from this guy, who 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 eventually came from Abraham, they knew that. Their genealogy, if you read the, the first chapter in Matthew, it's a genealogy. That's very important to the Jews. That they can trace their, their heritage back to Abraham because that's a central part of their faith. Because I belong to the chosen people of God, that means when this feast of the kingdom of God comes, I'm going to be let in. But Jesus is saying here, listen, I'm going to shut the door because I don't know you or where you come from. In fact, he goes on, if I guess to put a little bit of salt in the wound or a little bit of lemon juice in the wound, he says, people will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and take their places at the feast of the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who will last who will be first, and the first will be last. Okay, first for the Jews and for the Gentiles. It's stuff that we even read in Romans, okay? So this is very much the mindset of the Jews. But here's, here's, here's Jesus saying, listen, Gentiles are going to be in this feast before you. Gentiles are going to come and be a part of this feast before you. Okay, so as we look at the scripture, I know it sounds tough, but again, Jesus was definitely trying to challenge the people who are like, listen, my relationship with God is fine. Jesus, I don't need you. Okay, I don't need to, like, I, I, I got my relationship with God, it's fine. All the rest of the people are seeking, okay, what, what, how do you get into the house? Okay, that's a really good question, right? If Jesus says make every effort to get into the house while the door is open, right? The question is that we should probably need to know as Gentiles, okay, how do you get into the house? Now, we go over this every single Sunday at Hope Summit Christian Church. I try to make sure every single Sunday we go over this. Some of the, to the point that some of you might actually be getting tired of hearing it. That's a good thing, okay? Because one day, one day you are going to need to say this to someone, okay? If you take the challenges that we challenge you with here at the church, seriously, one day you're going to say this. So how do you get in the door? How do you make it into that last fi final kingdom? It's simple. You got to be made right before God because right now you're wrong before God because of your sin, Okay, in the beginning of all things, God created everything the way he wanted it to. The way he wanted it, perfect, holy, righteous, all was good. Okay, and you were created in the image of God, made to be right, made to be righteous and holy. And everything that he created and all the things that he, the way he wants us to live life, everything is perfect and pure and wonderful and great and there's light and there's love and, and there's great, all those things are in there, right? 
Now, when we stepped away from God in our sin, we stepped away from him and his will and all these things in our life, right? So we stepped outside of this. Now, if you step away from light, okay, because God is light, if you step away from love, because God is love, you step away from, from life, because God is the giver of life, what do you step into? If you step away from that stuff, what are you left with? You're left with darkness, death, right, and hatred. Guys, this question, as we look around our world today, where are we at? Okay? It's there. I mean, there's, don't get me wrong, there's plenty of light. There's lots of bits of light in our world today. But in general, we all know deep down, this is the state we're in. And that's because of our sin. That's because we walked away from a righteous, holy God. Okay? And so, and so, so God not being okay with this state, because with, with our sin is death. The, the wages of sin means death, right? God not being okay with this state, what did he do? He sent his son Jesus to this earth. Now, Jesus never stepped outside of this, right? He stayed righteous before God. He remained perfect. That's important. That he never sinned. He never walked away from God. And therefore, because he didn't sin, he didn't deserve to die. If the wages of sin is death, that means Jesus didn't deserve to die. But he went to the cross anyway. Okay, and Paul tells us that he became sin for us. Okay, so he steps out so that those who believe can step in, so that we can become the righteousness of God, so we can be made right in the eyes of God. Okay, so those who believe, those who are baptized, receive that gift of the Holy Spirit, guys, that you are then made right before God. That's how you get in the door. Okay, it says faith in Christ. Come as you are, like, Rick's, like Rick was saying during communion, right? Regardless of what you've done, and God knowing the things that you're going to do, right? What he has for you is love. What he has for you is a sacrifice where he took the punishment of your sin on himself. Okay, so that you could be made right before God. That's what he offers you. That's how we're made right before God. Uh, Paul uh, one, of, uh, one of the guys who, I mean, Paul was like the guy who persecuted Christians, and then when he met Jesus, he became a missionary for him, okay? Listen to what he says in Romans 3.22. It says, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all sin and fall short of the glory of God, and we are all justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. So you and I have been redeemed We've been brought back into this place of righteousness. We've been brought into a place of peace and love, right? We've been brought into a place of life. So that's how you get in the door. But what's interesting is Jesus' words when he says, make every effort to get into that door because it's narrow, right? Make every effort. Now, that word, again, difference between English and Greek. Make every effort is the word agonizomai. Okay, agonize on my, what does that sound like? You kind of get where I'm coming from now, right? When I talk about agonizingly difficult. Okay, agonize on my, it comes with, oh, there's like four different kinds of definitions on here. Uh, this, uh, to contend with an adversary, right? To endeavor with strenuous zeal, to strain after something, to get it. It's a contest, right? It's a fight. It's a struggle with difficulties, okay? That's what agonize on my means. And so when Jesus says make every effort. He's talking about a fight. He's talking about a struggle. He's talking about something that's going to cost you. It's talking about something that's going to require sacrifice. This is not necessarily going to be an easy thing. And that, again, to what Rick was saying before, that he just accepts you as you are, but he doesn't want to leave you in that place. He loves you too much to just leave you where you are. He wants to call you out to a higher standard, to something better, not just for your sake, but also for the sake of others, okay? That, that when it comes to faith in God, okay, we love the faith that says, okay, I can go to heaven now because I've been made right with God, right? The harder faith is when Jesus says, hey, sell what you got and give it to the poor, right? The harder faith is when he says, hey, I, I got all these plans for your life. I got all these plans for your life. And when you realize your plans don't necessarily match, that faith is harder, when he calls you to love your enemies, come on. How dumb is that? They're my enemies for a reason, right? I don't like these people. And he says, love them? Let alone how difficult it is. Let's just be honest. Let's just be honest, like middle class, upper class, white America people, which is mainly in our room right now. It is uncomfortable to be around the poor and the sick. It just is. Right? Can we just admit it? Can I just address the elephant in the room? That when we tell you to come and join us at Friendship Place and love on these kids, you're thinking, 
yeah, but they're different from me. And they don't respond to me the way my kids do. And they're a little bit naughtier than what I'm used to. And that kid doesn't speak any English. And so I just, I don't feel very good right here, right now. Right? This is, guys, this is the stuff that he calls us to do. And so the faith of accepting God so we can be made righteous before God, that's great. Love that. Please give me more of that. This faith of accepting Christ and his mission for your life, that's hard. And it requires agonize, oh my. It requires that effort inside where you got to push beyond your normal limits, where you got to sacrifice beyond what you're comfortable with, where you got to go to the places that no one else is willing to go. And there's a reason why he calls us to this, guys. The question that was asked, right? If Jesus is the only way, then doesn't mean that most people aren't going to make it. Well, Jesus answered it. Yes. Okay, which brings up another question. If Jesus is the only way and only a few are going to make it, how can God be good? A question that, again, you should care about. A question that should bother you. Now, again, you might, have been made, you might be like your own personal faith has maybe overcome this question already. But again, just for the sake of other people who genuinely don't want to pursue this God because they don't see him to be a good God. Because how could a good God make it so hard to find him? If he really is good, why would he make it so difficult? And here's how these two thoughts kind of connect. I think that question is misdirected. How can God be good if so many are going to visit? Guys, as I was studying this, my, my thought was, how can Christians call themselves good if this is the case? I know, guys, if I were to take like everyone who considered themselves to be a, a Christian, just with that label, right? There would be a lot more people than you think. I took them into my office one by one and said, hey, are you a good person or a bad person? They would say, well, I, I do this, I do that, and I don't do this and that, so I'm probably a good person, right? And when we look around in our churches and we say, oh, man, see that guy right there? He's a good person, right? That's a good person right there. Guys, following Jesus is hard. I'm not going to sugarcoat this for you, okay? The redemption that he has for you through faith, it, like when we say it's free, I feel like sometimes there might be a little bit of an asterisk right there, right? In-app, in-app purchases later, Right? Like, because what he calls us to is not easy. It's not easy. But guys, the the, the thing is, is that if Christians would pursue the the agonizomai stuff in life, I really know, I know it to be true that there would be, that, 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 that majority of people that won't find Jesus, that would shrink. Okay, that if the Christians would truly take upon themselves the call, the mission, the fight that we know God has called us to, and if we would all sacrifice more, give more of ourselves, get uncomfortable more often, then that vast majority of people who are not going to make it through would shrink. Yes, you would be able to be confident in standing before God and say, I know I'm doing this tough stuff. I know that through Christ that my salvation is free. But guys, as you walk the path, you make the path easier for other people to follow. Right? So Christians, I'm calling out. 2017 needs to be different than 2016. Not just for your sake, but for the sake of this vast majority that needs you to do the hard stuff so that they can have a chance to get through this narrow door. Yeah, the door is narrow, and yeah, it's shut. Listen, this is not a parable about like knowing how to open the door or being good enough to open the door. It's simply a parable of get through the door while the getting is good. Okay, that's what it's about. And that if you want to get through, you got to make every effort you got to agonize, you got to sacrifice, you got to go after the tough stuff, you got to get uncomfortable to go after this. So Christian, my question to you is this. What's going to be different this year? As you look forward to 2018, like, or I should say when you're in 2018 looking backwards, I'm curious if you're going to be able to look at a difference between who you are now and who you're going to be then. 
Okay, I want to challenge you to consider very carefully, very carefully, this idea that I'm going to do something really hard. Rick said I was going to introduce some guys here. We got our boys from Deep Teen Challenge here. Love you guys. Ed. Love having you here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to brag on our church a little bit here, so here we're going to kind of puff out our chest a little bit. They didn't, they didn't have a, a place. To, normally, we have these guys over. When we're here, typically, they're up on stage, right? And they're dressed all real nice, and they're, they're singing. Oh, it's so great to hear you guys singing again. Anyways, um, this, this weekend, they didn't have anywhere to go. And so I got an email saying, hey, they want to come to Hope Summit. Can they come? I was like, yes, that's my church, baby. That's right. They want to come here. I love it. Guys, but see, the reason I love it so much, these guys... These guys are an inspiration to me. How many of you guys have kids at home right now? How many of you guys have a spouse or a girlfriend that you love at home? How many of you have stuff that you miss in a storage unit or hanging? Okay. <laughs> guys, um, for those of you who don't know, uh, there's, uh, a lot of these guys are here um, at this Teen Challenge uh, place here in town. And uh, they're there for like a year or longer. A year or longer. And the Christmas season just hit. And that meant some of these guys didn't get to see their kids. Right? That's agonizing. Okay? Uh, I take my phone for granted. And uh, w- one time I broke my phone. And I was a big baby about it. Okay? <laughs> so maybe it's not as agonizing as not being around your kids. But still not a lot of fun. Right? Some of these guys I know, I know some of their stories that they, well, eventually it probably would have imploded upon them, but they were like in careers. They were making money, they were doing stuff, they were pursuing their dreams. But see, what they did was they realized that if I got to get healthy, I got to do something that's going to be agonizing. I got to do something really, really hard. And I think so, I think the, so highly of you guys that are going through this year-long program because you guys have the guts to do something that very few people would be willing to do. And so I hold you in very high esteem. I'm very proud of you. And uh, you're an inspiration to me. You really are. That you're willing to agonize for the sake of your families, for the sake of your health, and now you're finding for the sake of God, right? For his glory in your life, right? Yeah. I love you guys. Yeah. <laughs> so listen, I think we can just, again, I want to take, take a page from their book, right? I want to I wanna learn, like, what is it I got to sacrifice? What is it that I got to give up? What is it that I got to pursue that's going to be hard for the sake of myself, for the sake of my family, for the sake of the lost around me? You have no idea how if God is calling you to do something uncomfortable, how that might change your life, but also change the lives of other people around you. So my question, Christian, is what are you going to pursue that is agonizingly difficult this year? Now, when I first came into this church, I was challenging you guys a lot with this simple idea that, guess what? You are in charge of your relationship with God. That's up to you. And it's one of these sermons where it's kind of general. Like, I could spend the next hour giving hundreds of examples of things that you could do to take steps into, you know, your, your next step with God. But here's the deal. This is why you need the Spirit of God in your life, okay? Because you need that counselor in your life that's going to be tapping you on the shoulder saying, hey, this is what I want from you. This is the direction I want you to take. Because we're all in very different stages in our, in, in, in our relationship with God, which means there's different challenges. Some of you just need to be reading your word consistently. That's the only, that's the only, um, uh, 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 it's the only resolution, New Year's resolution that I um, actually kept. And it was on a whim. My dad, on, my, on the Bible app, I saw that my dad started a year-long through the Bible thing in a, in a translation of the Bible I hadn't read before. So I, I joined him on that, and we both, throughout the year, we did the whole one year through the Bible thing, right? Guys, you could do that. The Bible app is so great. How many of you are using it, like, right now? Anyway, yep. So great. There's a bunch. I love it. Okay, there's, there's some great um, things. You can just go in there. Log- so maybe for you, it's just it's, it's studying the Bible. Guys, we, we have these, these three things that we're always challenging you with. It's your personal disciplines. It's finding intentional relationships and it's learning to express your faith and love, okay? So maybe for you, it's a spiritual discipline. You got to get out there and get reading your Bible more. Maybe it's, you just need genuine prayer time where you put aside a half an hour or even, go, even, this might sound crazy, I know, but maybe one less show of the day, an hour of prayer. You sit down and you spend some time in prayer, 
Okay, so come again on Thursday, this Thursday, and we'll, we'll, we'll show you how easy it is to fill up an hour of prayer, right? Or maybe, maybe it's fasting, okay? Maybe for some of you, actually, this, this, maybe for some of you, it's just coming to church consistently. That's a spiritual discipline, and if you're not doing that right now, maybe that's your next step. So you understand, when, like, especially if you're fresh to the faith, I'm not asking you to, like, go be a missionary right now, okay? I'm asking you to take your next step in your relationship with God. For some of you, you need to be intentional with some relationships in your life, whether that is going out and finding someone who's going to call you out on your stuff. You need some accountability with something that you're facing. Okay, that's why we offer small groups around here. If you're interested in a small group, we can get you connected. There's lots of ways to sign up online, or you can sign up through the blue card or whatever. You just come talk to me, send me an email, however we can do that. That's why I want to connect you to small groups, because you need people in your life that are going to continue to encourage you and love on you and challenge you. And, 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 or maybe you need to do that in someone else's life. Maybe you're in a place where you recognize, yeah, I am living for God. I'm doing the difficult stuff. You need to help other people do that. So who in your life do you know who could really use your help to taking their next step in their relationship with God? Who do you need to be intentional with? The last one is expressing your faith and love. I'm always telling you guys, serve, 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 serve. We had to close the service um, this Sunday. We, I mean, we had to close, not service, good grief. We had to close children's ministry stuff this Sunday. Because we had just had a bunch of people out of town. It's no big deal. It's the New Year's. It's whatever. But guys, I'm looking around the room. Some of y'all could have come for service, right? And served. And then come and uh, you could have served one service and then come to a service, right? You could do that. And so maybe that's the agonizingly difficult thing is to change a diaper. Listen, I get it. I'm out of diapers. Been out for a while. I'm not interested in going back, okay? Maybe that's your next step. I don't know. Okay, well, so maybe, it's, maybe it's like friendship place, like I talked about. We had an awesome volunteer who was there every single Friday. She can no longer come. She had to move. We are in need of friendship place. Guys, maybe for you, the difficult thing is to come and hang out with us on Fridays at 345 every Friday in the afternoon to come and hang out with these kids. Yeah, they they're, can be kind of crazy sometimes. Okay, let's, let's go have craziness around us together. I'm there. I'd love to have my daughter comes with me. Just, yeah, come. And be a part of that. However it is that you think, maybe I could serve in this way. Maybe it's giving. Maybe it's, I don't know. What is your, what is your relationship with God need to look like this year? Okay? What's the agonizingly difficult thing that you need to pursue this year? So I'm asking you to make a New Year's resolution. I'm asking you to consider this. If you need to, do what that one guy did. I'm going to make up my mind by March so that I can make sure that I am taking this seriously and preparing myself to do something hard. Maybe that's what you need to do. That's fine. Set a reminder in your calendar, like he said, right? So what is your next step? Guys, I just know, if you're doing something agonizingly difficult for God, you're probably on the right track, okay? So let's be that church. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for this day, and I thank you so much for your grace and for your love. Um, Thank you that you didn't skirt around the hard issues. Thank you that you answered them so truthfully, even though the truth is difficult to hear sometimes. Father, I pray the Hope Summit Christian Church, the guys from Teen Challenge, God, that we would be the followers who are agonizing on your behalf. Jesus, you agonized for us. Thank you for the way that you showed us this great example. Jesus, through the cross. Through coming and living on this world. And if you could have just stayed up in heaven, God, I thank you for your perfect example. And I'm praying that your spirit would go with us. That your spirit would be ringing in our ears. That as we walk out these doors, as we get to our cars, as we pursue the normal busyness of life, that the enemy would have no foothold in our hearts and in our minds. That he would not be able to distract us from taking this message for this word. Okay? And that we would, that we would agonize on your behalf. Jesus, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Oh, here's my sign. Can y'all help me pick up the chairs? Uh, we're going to set, put them in stacks of seven or eight, sorry, stacks of eight, and then we'll push them up against the sides of the walls, if you would, please. Thank you.